Okay, let's continue. So today probably we are going to speed a little bit up. So let me just draw again the picture we had there. This is, say, the kernel of chi 1, the kernel of chi 2. This chi 1, chi 2, chi 3 are the Lyapunov exponents of these two matrices. So we have A and B in SL3C. That's Lyapunov, so eigenvalues. Lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, and also oops, the same for B. And we are assuming all of them are positive. You can take the square of the matrix, then the eigenvalues will be positive, and we are assuming they are real. So it's, it's our standing assumption. So the same with the others. And then we define this chi i of kl as being the logarithm of lambda 1 to the k of a lambda 2 to the k, lambda 1, but lambda i. These are these linear functionals, which we can extend naturally to R2. And these are exactly the, this is exactly the picture. So these are the kernels. And <coughs> let's say the chi 1 is positive here and is negative here. The chi 2 is positive here and negative here. And the chi 3 is positive here and negative here. So always you will have a picture like that. Model interchanging the chi 1 with chi 2 and chi 3 and so on. OK, so let me put the sign. So on this cone, you have that the first is plus, the second is plus, and the third is minus. Then if you jump here, you are jumping the first, so the, this plus is changing to a minus. So you have this. And then here, the guy that jumps is the third, so you have a minus plus plus. Here it jumps the second, so you have a minus minus plus, which naturally is the opposite cone to this. So whatever was plus has to become a minus. And then you jump the first again, so you get the plus minus plus, which again is the opposite of this. And you finally switch the last one and you get this. Okay? So these are the sign of the first, the second, and the third exponent in each of these cones. And over the lines, you will get that the guy, one of the guys vanish, and the other two respect the corresponding sign. <coughs> okay, now we have alpha from C squared diffeomorphisms of T3. It's just a homomorphism, so it's an action. And we assume that, well, let me first define here rho from C squared into SL3C <coughs> by rho of n equals to a to the k times b to the l, where here the n is the pair KL. Okay, so it's this homomorphism. This is injective by essentially assumption. So you have this nice homomorphism, and this homomorphism rho induce an action on the torus T2. Okay, where you for each n you apply this matrix on the torus T2. Now we have another guy. And we are going to assume what is known as the linear data, which will be an associated row, which is this. So each alpha of n will have a lift, alpha n tilde, from R3 to R3. There are several such lifts, but for what I'm going to say now, it doesn't matter. Eventually, I will have to be more careful with that such that alpha of n tilde is some matrix A of n, evaluated at the point x, plus some function phi n of x, which as always, this is the linear part, and this is the periodic part. Okay, and so this n belongs to SL 
3C and assumption is that AN equals exactly to this row N. So that assumption, it will happen, okay? So it will happen, so this, these matrices here will generate a homomorphism. It's some easy homotopy or homology theory, so you can do it by yourself, or just put the, comp the, 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 the composition here and you will get at once that this A, N, generate a homomorphism, and so you will have one generator which is A, another generator which is B. Okay. <coughs> and you can show that, you can assume that the eigenvalues are real. So this is unpositive, this is not really big deal. So there, there is no loss of generality on, on the assumptions I'm doing here. Okay. So I say it again. Uh, no, it's not right. Of course, there is KK. It should be an L here. Good. Thanks. Okay. <coughs> so now. I, I will make my next assumption, which I don't really need to, to do this first step, but let me just do it to make things easy for me. So next assumption there exists n naught in C square such that Alpha of n naught is an Ossoff. Okay, the linear guys are all an Ossoff because no eigenvalue has modulus one, but I'm assuming that one of the nonlinear guys is an Ossoff. Okay, so say it's this n naught here where the guy is an Ossoff. So let's assume we have this guy. We don't know anything about all the other guys, but this guy is an Ossoff. Okay. Now, if we go to our previous lecture, we know that there exists H from three such that H compose alpha of n naught is rho of n naught. H homomorphism, homotopic to identity. Here there is one more property it has, which I will leave it as an exercise. It follows essentially, well, the statement will be two statements. One is easy, follow from the formula I gave you. The other is a little bit harder. H is Helder continuous and H inverse is Helder continuous. Okay, so H and its inverse are Helder continuous. So the fact that H is Helder continuous is just followed from the formula I gave you. The fact that H minus one is Helder continuous is a little bit trickier, but the geometry behind is the same as the fact that H is Helder continuous. Okay. So I want to conjugate not just this n naught, I want to conjugate all n's with the corresponding row n, okay? So my first step will be to show that H conjugates all of them. <coughs> you will do it, I will not do it, but I will state how to do it. <coughs> so to this n, it's very important to be able to lift the action to the whole T3, uh, to the whole R3. So here I took a lift. So for each n I can take a lift, but I may make some mistake, and this lift may be not matching correctly. So if I take this lift at random, this family of diffeomorphisms of R3 will not form a group action. Okay, I have to be careful to choose the lift so that I really get a group action. 
I will now do it carefully. Alpha and not as a fixed point. And this is obvious because the linear guy fixed the zero and H is homomorphism, so the preimage of zero will be fixed by alpha and not. Okay, so you have a fixed point. So then we can lift alpha and not to alpha tilde and not such that alpha tilde and not fixes this point. Fixes a point. Okay, I just pick this leaf. <coughs> now I take another, let's call, let's call this point x naught, obviously three, X point X not tilde in R three such that X not tilde plus C three X not. So these are the conjugal C classes of points in the torus. So that is, this means this guy plus X to X not. So you can just pick one and make a lift that fixes this point. That's the easy way of taking lifts, indeed. Now I take another alpha n, okay? So what happens with alpha n of x naught? Well, I wish this guy were also x naught. So these were also fixed by x naught. This may fail. I don't know if this is true. But if I apply alpha n naught to this, then these two guys commute. So this is the same as alpha of n times alpha of n naught of x naught, but x naught is fixed by this guy, so this is alpha n of x naught. So I get another fixed point for alpha n naught. Okay, so for whichever n I'm picking, alpha n of x naught is another fixed point. Okay, and alpha n naught is an loss of dimorphism. It doesn't have infinitely many fixed points have a lot of periodic orbits, but not fixed points. Fixed points are only finitely many. So it means that there should be, so the, the, the amount of ends where I will start getting different things are finite. Okay, so then I can take gamma, which is the stabilizer of this x naught, which is all the ends such that alpha n of x naught equals to x naught, so this is a subgroup. And this observation I just said implies that C squared mod gamma is fine. Because if, if you have infinite many co-classes here, then it will mean that you are doing infinitely many different things here, which implies that alpha and not has infinitely many fixed points. And this cannot happen. It's just an exercise, you, you, you can do it. Well, this is the gamma, so if you remember the theorem I stated, I stated there exists a gamma, a subgroup of finite index where I have really conjugacy. Well, this is the gamma I was stating in the theorem. <coughs> okay, so from now on, I'm working only on gamma. Forget about the other elements of the action. Still doesn't matter, I have the same picture. Okay, once I have a fixed point, x naught, and it's fixed for every element, so I have that by definition, alpha n of x naught is x naught for every n in gamma, I can fix the leaves such that alpha of x naught tilde. I define this leaf so that it, they have this fixed point. And now this will form a group action. Have that this alpha tilde, so with this definition,
Exactly. So, I, I, so all this argument is to be able to pick this very same x not tilde for all the for all the, the the guys. So I can have the point x not here in the torus T3. I have the point x not tilde in R3, and it has all the other translates. So here is the x not tilde plus the one zero zero, for example. So it's a translate of this guy. So all these guys project onto x not. And I can pick the lift, and it will be a unique lift that fixes this point. I can pick another lift that will fix this point. And I can even take another lift that sends this point to this point. Okay? But this will be all different lifts. I choose the lift that fixes this point. Exactly. So that, yes, yes, yes. And that's, I'm choosing this lift here so that this same x still and out works for everyone. And, and you can do it. So as, no, as, as long as you know that it's a fixed point here, you can lift it as a fixed point there. So this is my definition, this alpha of n tilde I'm defining up there. Yes? Say it again. Mm. No, no, you, you get it from the age. Indeed, the x not. Yeah, because here you have a fixed point, which is 0. So indeed, the x not is nothing but h minus 1 of 0. It's exactly this guy. OK, now I can lift everything to R3. And I can now write down this formula for these very specific lifts. OK, and I have a family of different of, of smooth map phi n and these linear maps here. And they really make some nice gain. Only on gamma. Uh, yes, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Thanks. Yeah, probably we forget about gamma not being the whole C square. So gamma is isomorphic to C square in an event. So don't worry if I just renormalize everything and assume that gamma is already C square. Okay? So it's, I'm only working on this gamma. Okay. <coughs> so you have this global fixed point. So now the next lemma says alpha. N, H compose alpha N is rho N compose H for every N in gamma. Okay. So that's, so it, the, the same H not only works for N naught, it works for every other guy. And did it more is true, the way we solve this equation, and this is very important, the way we solve this equation, the h corresponding to a lift, which was of the form x plus u of x. Okay, and we show that h tilde composed alpha tilde n naught was equals to rho n naught composed h. So that's the way we started to solve this equation. So everything in R3. And that's what we get. And what you prove is that the same is true for the H tilde. For every N. And this, this formula implies this formula. H is a homeomorphism. So let me just leave this as an exercise. So the observation is that there is a unique H tilde solving this equation. Okay? You can solve it in very different ways. So you can assume there are two of them uh, and then get it. Or the, the point is that if you define, take an N, oops, 
Oops, H tilde. We call this H tilde n. So the claim is H n equals to H. So that's the claim. That's how you prove it. So you define this guy here, this H and tilde, and then you go and prove that this H and tilde coincide with H tilde. And then you get it. Uh, there should be minus one somewhere, yes. Thanks. <coughs> this is an exercise, so it's really, it's, there's plenty of proofs of this, so it's, it's, let me not enter into that. Okay, so now I know already that the homeomorphism works for everyone. Okay, so this is indeed the easy part. Now comes the hard part to prove that this homeomorphism is a diffeomorphism, indeed. Okay. Move on. <coughs> oh, to lift. Just to lift, just to lift and have an action, and have an action here. So it's important in this proof that you, you still have an action here, so the commutativity. Yes. So it's, it's important that this guy here commutes with the alpha n not. If you are not lifting correctly, then you will not have the commutativity. You have the commutativity plus some error term, and then it makes everything very nasty. Now comes the album of exponents for the nonlinear action. Okay, so we discussed the Apple of exponents for the linear action, but now we have a nonlinear action, the alpha, and we want to discuss the Apple of exponents for these guys. Now to discuss the Apple of exponents, you need to have a measure. Okay, and since measures are a delicate subject here, we are going to play with the most simple measure, which are periodic orbits. Okay, periodic orbits are easier to, to deal with. So, take a point P, periodic by alpha n naught. They are dense of, of, of such guys. Then, <coughs> the same argument as we did there will give you that this gamma p, which are all the n's such that alpha n of p equals to p. So this is a subgroup. So this is a stabilizer of p. And you have that c squared mod gamma p is one. Because once this guy is periodic for this guy, then you will not have infinitely many periodic points of the same period. So you need this to be finite. It's exactly the same argument. Which means that I can concentrate on this gamma p and <coughs> assume that this point is periodic for all the elements. The, the, on the gamma p, this point is fixed for all the elements on the gamma p. So now I take n in gamma p and consider this derivative here, which is a map from e p t3 linear map from R3 to R3. So three-dimensional vector space to three-dimensional vector space. It has eigenvalues, and it has what is called the Apple of exponents, which are the logarithm of the modulus of the eigenvalues. And this is for each n. So it's a very same discussion as we did here. It will happen here. OK, so you will have is dimension three. You will have three Lyapunov of exponents. Put a 
subscript P <coughs> so you have this really upon of exponent as it is P so just think of you have two commuting matrices and you have the whole C square action here so you, you have the commutativity so you have two commuting matrices and they are jointly, jointly um, not essentially not diagonalizable in principle. They may have the Jordan blocks, but they have the same Jordan blocks. Okay, so this is just basic linear Ashura. So these two guys may coincide here. Okay, but still I have, well, one have to go through all the possible possibilities, but you will have, in the nicest case, you have three directions, and this is Lyapunov of the exponent along the first direction, this Lyapunov of the exponent along the second direction, and Lyapunov of the exponent along the third direction. Okay, and that's what I go, we are going to prove. The next lemma says that that's really the case. There, is, there are three directions for this P, and this Lyapunov of the exponents, the three of them are different, and indeed the three of them are exactly well, not exactly, but they really look like this. I would like to prove that they are the same. I will not be able to prove that they are exactly the same, but close enough. So, so the lemma depends on some ordering. So I, in principle, I make some arbitrary choice of this chi 1, chi 2, chi 3. I will need to make some more careful choice of who is 1, who is 2, and who is 3. But by such choice, you have this lemma. There exists a positive constant, indeed. <coughs> yeah, there is a larger than 1, indeed. Larger than or equal to 1, it could be 1, such that for every P periodic by alpha and not, there exist three numbers, alpha I of P, I one, two, and three. This is a positive real number. Indeed, it's more than positive. Let me just put the I. This guy is larger than 1 over C inverse and smaller than C. So, so it's bounded and bounded away from 0 independent of P. Such that alpha I of P times chi I P is equal to chi I. Maybe let me emphasize a rho here are the chi i of the row. So the Lyapunov exponents of the nonlinear are positive multiple of the Lyapunov exponents of the linear. So I want this guy to be a 1. So if you imagine that these two guys are smoothly conjugated, then this will be a 1. Because if the guys are smoothly conjugated, the derivative of the conjugacy will make these matrices conjugated to the row matrices. And if you have conjugated matrices, then you have same eigenvalues, hence same Lyapunov exponents. Now I have a weaker property than this. I only know they are positively proportional. But I know that the rate of proportionality is bounded above and below. So this has to do with the Helder property of Oops, H. The fact that this rate of proportionality is, is uniformly bounded above and below is the Helder property of H and the inverse. But I, I will leave this part as an exercise, but I, what I want to explain is why they are proportional. Okay? <coughs> okay, so let's try to argue of how to prove they are proportional. Now you have to play a little bit between the linear and nonlinear dynamics. So proof of lemma.
2 here, and this is lemma 2. Say it again. Hey, <laughs> not both at the same time. <laughs> Okay, so here is yes, it depends on the point, periodic point P, and also it depends on the direction you are taking. So this is this is not the number, this is a linear function. That, 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 that's exactly the point. Uh, and the positivity, so good. Now, that's a very good observation because this tells me exactly what I need to prove. So I have two linear functionals, and I want them to agree. So what's the first thing to do? To show that the kernels agree. If the kernels of the functional agree, then the functional agree up to a multiple. Then the second thing I need to prove is that the half space Agree. So when I have positive for this guy, I have positive for the other guy, and vice versa. Because then I will know that they agree up to a multiple. And that's what you are going to prove here, that they agree up to a multiple. Let me now draw the picture. This is the wrong guy. This is the one direction. This is the two direction. And this is the three direction. Now I have this P point there. I know that the alpha naught, I don't really need it, but I know that the alpha naught is an osov. So I will have, and let's say the n naught was in this place I draw. So <coughs> I have a picture like this. Okay, where this is expanding and these are contracting. Even though I, I don't really have these two lines so far. I only have a two-dimensional stable manifold and one-dimensional unstable manifold. In principle, this eigenvalue here could be complex, so which means that I don't have these two lines. I have to prove that I have these two lines. Okay, let's go first to the third direction. I will leave the hard part, which is the other two directions for you. Okay, as an exercise. <coughs> so, so, let's show that these two kernels match. This is indeed very easy. Well, I need to make a choice here, so you have to be a little bit careful. You have to fix all the problems I'm doing here. But it's not that bad. I know that this unstable manifold go by the conjugacy to the corresponding unstable manifold. Conjugacy sends unstable to unstable. So I have a way to numbering these three with these three. And now I'm numbering the Lyapunov exponent so that this third direction match with this third direction. And I have a topological background for saying that. <coughs> OK, so one. We said that I want to prove this kernel. So what are the possibilities? Is that these two kernels do not match. Okay, but if these two kernels do not match, then there exists an n such that chi three p of n is positive and chi three rho of n is negative. So I can make one positive and the other negative. So if they don't match, I can do that. This is they don't match by a positive. Multiple, I can do that. But then this will imply that when I take alpha n, it will expand this direction, but you're conjugated to a guy that is contracting this direction. This is not possible. Okay, so contracting is mapped by a homomorphism into contracting, and expanding is mapped to an expanding. 
So if two points are positively asymptotic by the conjugacy, they remain positively asymptotic. And they, if they are negatively asymptotic, then they remain negatively asymptotic. So I have these two points that for the alpha n, for this n, are positively asymptotic. And this will be mapped to two different points because H is a homomorphism, and they cannot be positively asymptotic. So this is a contradiction. That's how you prove it. And that's it. The same thing you will do here a little bit more. <coughs> but that's why it's very important that I know already that the H works for everyone. Okay, the very same H works for everyone. Okay, that's it. That's the proof that the kernels match. Not only the kernel match, the half spaces should match because if not still you can get the same inequality. And then you do the same. Okay, so let's move on because I don't have infinite time. <coughs> so what is next step? Next step is to answer a question of one of you. No, I'm not you, but anyway. I have these guys and also. It's just by itself. It's very few conditions, so I want much more guys. So what I will prove is, if I call this cone C, so the next lemma will be that I could pick whatever point here, and all these guys will be an also as well. Not just this guy, every guy here is an also. And it's a little bit more delicate, but it's not that bad. So this is the veil chamber. C, so the lemma, which is the one which contains the original and also element, lemma, for every n in C, alpha n is an also. <coughs> All these guys are an also. Okay, how will we prove that? So you, you see what we are doing. So maybe look a little bit random, but it has a direction. But still what we are doing is the following. If you know that H were smooth, all the statements I'm doing are all trivial. Okay? So because if H is smooth, then I have full matching of this Lyapunov exponents. I will have the NOS of property trivially satisfied just by using the, the smooth conjugacy H, but I don't know H is smooth. So what I'm recovering is all the properties H will give me. Okay, and at the end of the day, with all this property, I will prove that H has to be smooth. But well, the problem, you, you can start doing infinitely many properties and not getting really what you want. So this has a direction, so it took a while to realize that this is the type of property you have to recover. This is just periodic data. It is enough. It's periodic data, but with uniform bounds. Yes. Because the point here is, to prove this lemma, I really need the periodic point to become fixed for element of, all elements of the actions. So I, I, I needed to assume that the measure associated with this point was invariant by the whole action. And then this takes us to Amir's lectures. So, what are the measures invariant by the whole action? Alpha action. Well, alpha is continuously conjugated to the linear action, so I can just restate the question. So, what are the invariant measures for the linear action? Well, this is the same as times two times three conjecture. So, you have the periodic measures? Good. You have Lebesgue measure? Good. Is there any other measure? Not of positive entropy. So, I could state this for Lebesgue measure, well, for the entropy maximizing measure, which is the counterpart to Lebesgue measure. And for any invariant measure I could state, but there are not many measures, so it's, it's, it's useless. <coughs> but I, I, I have it for periodic points. And these are a lot. Periodic points are a lot, a lot of them. <coughs> and that's what I, it enters here. Okay, so how you prove that a, a guy is an also if you use the definition, okay? So we need a splitting, so proof. If 
E S N of T3. So we need to create a splitting which is invariant by the alpha n. And once we know that the splitting is invariant by the alpha n, we need to know that this guy is contracted by iterate of alpha n, this guy is contracted to the past by iterates of the alpha n. That's what we need to know. Okay, so the most difficult part in general is to find the splitting. But here, the splitting we have. You can see what happens in the linear. I never change signs. So the stable for every linear guy here is always the same stable. It's the E1 plus the E2. Plus the E2. And the unstable is the E3 direction. So for the linear, that's what happens. And I will do the same for the nonlinear. So I will choose, maybe let me emphasize here that this corresponds to the nonlinear. So I will define this stable space as being the stable space for the n naught, and this unstable space as being the unstable space for the n naught. Just will define it this way. And for n naught, I know because n naught is an osov. Now, the fact that alpha n commutes with alpha n naught will make that these bundles are invariant. So the invariance is not a problem. So now I need to gain contraction. How we get contraction? I take logarithm of the norm. Let's just to make my life a little bit simple. Let me call f equals to alpha n. Okay, so it's just one different morphism here. So now we can forget a little bit about the whole action. I take function a of x, logarithm of the norm of derivative of x at x on this stable direction. Two minutes, I guess. I take this this function. Did not just this function. I have the whole family of functions. Okay. So if I want to show that the guy is an also, what I need to prove is that claim there exists some n positive integer such that norm of dx of n on this stable direction not is less than 1 for every x. If I know that this contracting for every single point x at this iterate, then the guy will be an also. Because then you can just write down formulas and, and get that the constant c and the lambda strictly less than 1. So it's a compactness assumption. So if it is less than 1 at every point, then it is less than 1 minus epsilon. At every point, this 1 minus epsilon is the contracting rate on n iterates. Then you, but this fixed big capital M, but then you will have that it is also true for every small n. So, now, what does this mean? This means that what I need to prove is that there exists an n such that a n x is for every x. So it's the same thing. That's what I need to show. Because I take logarithms, and that's what I get. So that's the next lemma. Shouldn't have erased this. Too bad. Too late. Okay. So the lemma says the following. Let 
A N R family of continuous. These are continuous multiplicative cycles. Okay, so that means a n plus m of x is smaller than a n composed f m plus a for every n m x. So it's multiplicative ergodic theorem guy. Okay, now if the integral, well, more than the integral, the infimum of 1 over n integral a n x d mu x is negative for every um, infimum in n positive, for every mu invariant by s, then there exists n positive such that a n of x is less than zero for every x. And that's what I want. I'm over due time, so I will not write anything else, but let me just comment. I will leave this as an exercise. It's a non-trivial exercise, but it's still an exercise. I have, I even have done my own proof of this, but this I have seen probably 10, different proofs of this, maybe not that very different, but by different people thinking that they were the first proving it. So it's this type of lemma which is very basic, is very important, and I think the first ones were some guys in the 90s that, that, that proved this. Maybe, maybe it appeared even earlier than that. Anyway, so let, let me just comment on the proof. So what does it mean? So the, the for all here is some kind of unique ergodicity. So imagine that you, instead of having a subadditive cocycle, you have an additive guy. So it's, this would mean taking a Birkhoff sums of functions. Okay, so if you know that the integral of the function is exactly the same constant for every invariant measure, then what you will get is that Birkhoff sums converge uniformly. Okay, so this is the same as when you play with unique ergodicity. Now here is essentially the same assumption but with inequalities and with multiplicative ergodic theorem. Okay, so if you know that the integral is negative, then you can prove that it's less than a constant for every measure. So the space of measure is compact. So you can always put less than a constant here, a negative constant here, and then you use the subadditive property to show that you will have this going to minus infinity with n in a uniform way. Okay, so indeed what you prove here is that there exists constant c negative such that a n of x is smaller than minus c n for every n larger than n, or even better, there exists constant d positive. That's what you prove, indeed. <coughs> and again, it's, it's, it's not really that difficult. Okay, so once you have this, this is very important for us, not just in this context, it's in general, it will be very useful for us in, in, in what comes next time. So you get this claim, which implies this claim, which means that this stable guy is contracting, you do exactly the same unstable. Now, and I finish with this, how I get this integral to be negative? Well, these are the Lyapunov exponent. If you take this logarithm of the norm, this Limit here is the Lyapunov exponent on the stable direction, so the largest Lyapunov exponent on the stable direction associated to the measure mu. Now the measure mu can be approached by, by periodic orbits, and on periodic orbits, I have that this is less than a constant, less than zero. Because on periodic points, I know the Lyapunov exponents. That's why I proved the lemma that I erase exactly there. Okay, so that's it. Next time, I will use this to prove the smoothness of the guy. Thanks.